Jesus Christ risen indeed. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. Uh, it's great to have you with us this Easter as we celebrate. We celebrate Jesus. And today I want to celebrate the power of the empty cross. This empty cross. We want to remember that the power comes to us from the death that occurred on this cross, but also the resurrection. So not only will we speak about the empty cross, but we'll also celebrate the empty tomb. The power of your forgiveness comes from this empty cross. The cross is a, a public symbol of death. And this is what was necessary for our sacrifice, for our salvation, I mean. The sacrifice was required that would open the way up for us to be reconciled with God. Listen to the way Paul writes about this in Colossians chapter 2. You were dead in your sins, and your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then he, God, gave you a share in the very life of Christ. For he forgave all your sins and blotted out the charges proven against you, the list of his commands which you had not obeyed. He took this list of sins and he destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin. And God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins were taken away. This cross is a message of the work of Jesus, and it's a, it's a reminder of the completed work of Jesus to bring us back to God. And yet, the cross is a powerful symbol of death. For those who, who don't believe in Jesus, it's a reminder that death will always be before them and will always be with them. But for those, those of us who have faith, it's a reminder that God overcame death so that we could have eternal life with Him. So when we look at the empty cross, I wanted to remind us of the promise that the cross gives us. Romans chapter 1, listen to this. To the fullest extent of my ability, I'm ready also to preach God's good news to you. For I'm not ashamed of this good news, Paul writes, for it's about Christ. It is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe to heaven. This message was preached first to the Jews alone, but now everyone is invited to God in the same way. This good news tells us that God makes us ready for heaven. He makes us right in God's sight when we put our faith and trust in Christ to save us. This is accomplished from the start and to the finish by our faith. As the scripture says, the man who finds life will find it through trusting God. And Paul continues to speak of this promise in chapter 4. He says, if you still claim that God's blessings go to those who are good enough, then you are saying that God's promises to those who have faith are meaningless. And faith is foolish. But the fact of the matter is this. When we try to gain God's blessing and salvation by keeping His laws, we always end up under His anger. For we always fail to keep them. The only way we can keep from breaking the laws is not to have any to break. So God's blessings are given to us by faith as a free gift. And we're certain to get them whether or not we follow the Jewish customs if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of us all when it comes to these matters of faith. The good news of God comes to each of us through this cross and it's a message that should stir us each to have faith in God. For, for God is faithful to the promise that He makes. The empty cross reminds us of, of the promise. But the empty cross also opens up a way which I've called the process. The good news for you is that each one of us is invited into the process of the cross. Paul continues to write in Romans chapter 6, For we were died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Since we've been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was, Christ was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin, for we died with Christ we were set free from the power of sin. 
And since we died with Christ, we know we'll also live with Him. We're sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has power over Him. When He died, He died once, and He died to break the power of sin. But now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So you, so we also should consider ourselves dead to the power of sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So what does this mean for us? If we're invited into the process, it means we cannot be saved by just being spectators. We must engage in the process of the cross by embracing the cross for ourselves. This is not that our work would save us, for we cannot be saved by what we do, but we're saved by our decision to go into the waters of baptism and to join in with the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Just as Jesus didn't stay on the cross, so too we would be sure that each one of us is raised to a new life with Jesus. But if we don't choose to embrace the process, then we don't get to see the life that Jesus makes available. It's as simple as that. The process is only for those who want to have their lives transformed by Jesus. What do I mean by being transformed? I simply mean that we would become dead to the power of sin at work in our lives. It's only through this process. And if we choose to ignore the process of the cross, then surely it becomes obvious that we would miss out on the power of the cross. Romans chapter 7, Paul continues to write to us. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ, and now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in our death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it, and we're no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in a new way of living in the Spirit. This is the life that we want to see that we're invited into, to participate into the power of the cross that um, Paul calls a harvest of good deeds for God. And what kind of good deeds would they be? Perhaps it would mean rescuing cats from trees and helping old ladies to cross the road. Well, surely these are good things to do. It's wonderful to be helpful. But this is not what Jesus meant when he went to the cross. The harvest of living in the Spirit is much more powerful and we should each aspire to it. Jesus points us to the harvest of good deeds that he would desire we would have and he, he speaks this in Mark chapter 16. Jesus says to us, let's personalize this, you are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who refuse to believe will be condemned. And those who believe, we who have a good harvest of good deeds, will use the authority of Jesus to cast out demons and speak in new languages. We will be able to even handle snakes with safety, and if we drink anything poisonous, it will not hurt us. And we will be able to place our hands on the sick, and they will be made well. This is the power of the cross that is work as the fruit of what Jesus has accomplished. The power of the cross at work in our lives is what brings the proof of Jesus and his cross to our community. We have the promise of new life that comes through the empty cross. We have the process that we're invited into that would come uh, lead us into life ever after because the power works in us. So the promise, the process, the power leads us to the proof of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, we are saved by trusting. And trusting means looking forward to getting something we don't yet have. For a man who already has something doesn't need to hope and trust that he'll get it. But if we must keep trusting God for something that hasn't happened, it teaches us to wait patiently and confidently. And in the same way, our faith, by our faith, the Holy Spirit helps us with our daily problems. And it helps us in our praying, for we don't even know what we should pray, nor how to pray as we should, 
But the Holy Spirit prays for us with such a feeling that it cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts. Well, we will know what the Spirit is saying as He pleads for us in harmony with God's own will. And we know that all this happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into His plans. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to Him, and all along He knew who would, should become like His Son, so that His Son would be the first with many brothers. And having chosen us, He called us to come to Him. And when we came, He declared us not guilty, filled us with Christ's goodness, and gave us right standing with Himself. And He promised us His glory. This is the goal of our salvation, that we would carry the glory, each one of us, the glory that Christ made available. Now, I want to speak about the glory in a second. But before I do, I want to remind you the cross of Jesus is a powerful symbol of death. For those who do not believe it, it is a reminder of the absence of hope in their lives. And for those who have faith, it is a reminder of the God who chose to be the message of hope. The power of your forgiveness comes from the empty cross. Each one of us forgiven by the power of this empty cross. And what about the empty tomb? Jesus spent so much time with his Father in prayer and conversation that he knew what was going to happen. He knew what lay before him. And yet it says in Hebrews 12 that he endured the pain and the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before him. That joy, I believe, was the glory that God had prepared for him that he was going to invite us into. You are that joy. We are that joy. Each one of us are that joy that gave Jesus the strength to endure that cross of suffering. And as Kathy read in the opening from Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, the tomb didn't hold Jesus. As we sang in that classic by Jeff Bullock, um, death could not hold him down. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The empty tomb tells us a story that we can each be part of, that we would desire to be part of as his church. Jesus knew that the Father would wrap him up in glory, and, and we know this because we read about it in one of the final prayers that Jesus uttered when he was in the garden the night he was betrayed. In John chapter 17, it says, When Jesus finished saying all these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Reveal the glory of your Son so that He can give the glory back to you. For you've given Him authority over every man and woman in all the earth. He gives eternal life to each one you've given Him. And this is the way to eternal life, by knowing you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by doing everything you told me to do. And now, Father, reveal my glory as I stand in your presence the glory we shared before the world began. Jesus is glorified. Say glorified. 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 This is nice, you say. And it might be easy to say that Jesus would be glorified, for after all, He is God. But the prayer of Jesus goes much, much deeper than this for us. If we continue to read in John 17, Jesus says, I'm not only praying for these disciples are here, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Guys, that's us. I pray that they, we, would all be one, just as you and I are one, God. And as you are in me, Father, I am in you, and they may be in us, that the world would believe that God sent Jesus. I've given them glory, the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given to be with me where I am. Then they can all see the glory that you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. This is what we get access to because of the empty tomb. Death could not hold him down because it pleased God to raise him from the dead. The glory that Jesus prayed for himself becomes ours. And what is this glory? simply defined as the reality of God's beautiful holiness being made real and tangible in our lives. The beautiful reality of God's beautiful holiness being made real and tangible in our lives. This is the glory that becomes for us. Not only was Jesus glorified, 
but also he was exalted. Say exalted. 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 This means he was highly established before God. We read in the Philippians chapter 2 this, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, He gave up his divine privileges. He took a humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When Jesus appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the highest place of honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue on earth declare Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Not only was Jesus glorified so that he revealed the beautiful holiness of God, but that we might also be glorified in that also. Jesus was exalted because God chose to elevate him to a place above the place of a servant. In fact, he would be the king of all kings. The good news for us As much as we're invited in to the process of the cross, we also become partakers of the life of the glory of Jesus. Say partakers. 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 We get to experience that glory also. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, he prays for us that we would understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he's far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. The church is his body and the church is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. As we become the church, as we grow into being the church, we're united in Jesus and we become full and complete with everything he makes available for us. When we're faithful to the end, the Bible says, as we journey through life made strong by him, we become partakers in Jesus Christ and all that he has. The only way we can achieve this is with God's help. We're not clever enough, smart enough, strong enough, or faithful enough to do that. It's only by God helping us that we, and and by, I suppose, us being connected and committed to each other, this unity is the pathway to the glory that Jesus promised as the fruit of the empty tomb. Paul continues to write in Ephesians 4 to give us instructions on how we might partake in what Jesus makes available. Paul says to us, we should be humble. We should be gentle. We should be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of our love for each other that he gave us. We should try always to be led along together by the Holy Spirit and to be at peace with each other. We're all parts of one body, but we have the same spirit. And we've all been called to the same glorious future. For there is only one Lord, There is only one faith, there is only one baptism, and we all have the same God and Father who is over us all and who's in us all and living through every part of us. So hopefully we see that the empty tomb makes a way for Jesus to be glorified, and then Jesus invites us also to be glorified. The empty tomb Because of the empty tomb, because of the obedience of Jesus, it pleased God to exalt Jesus to the highest place of honor. He is exalted. And as we learn to live with Jesus and each other in humble faith, let's say, we'll become partakers of that life. And finally, this is the key for today. It's how we see Jesus and how he's seen in us. Listen to the way John writes about his revelation of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. This is Jesus in all his glory. John says, When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. 
And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe and a gold sash, wool as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like the mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was like the sun in all its brilliance. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said to me, don't be afraid. I am first and I am the last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. Friends, this is the Jesus that we sing about, that we worship, that we give our lives to, the glorified Jesus. And this is the Jesus that should be revealed for all to see. Can you say revealed? He should be revealed. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Everyone will know that Jesus is Lord. But more than that, Jesus wants to be revealed in our lives today. He wants you to know that through his sacrifice and and through this empty cross, there's a possibility that you and others can find reconciliation. The cross is empty because Jesus accomplished all that was necessary for our salvation. Jesus wants you to know that he wants to be revealed in your life through the power of his resurrection. The tomb is empty because it pleased God to give all authority over sickness and death. And this is the same for you today. No grave will hold you as you believe in Jesus. You can have the power and authority over sickness um, of the body and, and let's just say sickness of the mind because of the finished work of Jesus. I invite you to stand. We want to declare ourselves as those who have faith in Jesus And the finished work of Jesus, the cross is empty, friends, because it's done. The tomb is empty because it's done. Now, I want you to join us in this final song. And the reason I chose this song is because it's such a powerful declaration. What I would hope is that these words would fill your mouth with a proclamation that comes out of faith. That truly, truly, there is power that comes to us from the resurrected Lord. He is powerful, but He wants you to know that you are powerful also. May your proclamation be bold. Come on, let's sing this in a way that makes the devil tremble, because we're the powerful church. All right? Jesus is risen. Let's sing. This is where the rubber hits the road, I guess. This is where we have to decide if we believe the Word of God or not. I didn't put the Scripture in, but Paul writes in Romans 10 that we, we, we are saved by faith, and how do we get faith? But by hearing the Word of God. We've heard today the proclamation of the good news of Jesus in the Word of God. Now we have to decide if we believe it. There's no grave that could hold Jesus. Come on. And I would propose that there's no grave that can hold you when you have faith in Him.